Nick. Welcome to the Lucky Orange Show. Hey, Sean. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, as always. Uh, and also, thank you for, you know, for those of you out there that, that aren't aware, we're a U.S.-based company, but we're also specifically a Kansas City-based company. So this is a big week in Kansas City. We uh, are collectively Super Bowl champs, not just the team. And so everybody in the office, there's a lot of hubbub and excitement, and there's a big parade tomorrow. Um, so thank you, Nick, for carving out time during such a celebratory week to chat about UX with me. Let's say you're in an Uber and they say, what do you do for a living? What's your response to that? Um, so I definitely probably stick with product designer still, um, but you always have to add on in tech, I feel like, because <clears throat> a lot of people hear product designer and they think you're you know, designing tools or radios or watches. Like there's a the wide range of things, but not physical products um, so much as digital products, um, but it also refer to myself as an experience designer, user experience designer, um, kind of under that UX umbrella. Um, but I found referring to myself just as kind of an experience designer who works in te tech typically uh, kind of gets the most direct questions, but there's always going to be a follow-up question because people still are just, I guess, unaware. This is kind of a newer um, role within the past, like at least eight to five to eight years. So a lot of people aren't aware of really what a product designer is. Um, so usually stick with that. Yeah. And experience design is such kind of like a puppet master sort of idea where you're saying, <laughs> I, I, I know what somebody wants well enough to design the product or whatever it might be for them. Um, and there's a lot of ideas that float around. I know internally, we have a great rapport across teams, cross functionally, where ideas are shared um, about product enhancements, things that we hear from customers to learn to say, hey, here's what they're looking for. What's been kind of the most important thing you've done since joining Lucky Orange to sort of capture those ideas and make sure that a good idea doesn't, doesn't just fade away into the, the ether? Sure. I definitely, so outside of your standard, I guess, like processes that we have in place here at Lucky Orange, um, I'm big on kind of having my own journaling habits. So keeping a notebook to the side, um, rely on field notes, having one in the pocket as much as possible and trying to capture that stuff. Cause I just, I know I'm human and within five minutes of hearing an idea and then switching to something else, I'm, I'm going to forget that anyway. So I try to write it all down. Um, so physical media is my kind of go-to. I try to at least journal, um, no restrictions, no rules, kind of unstructured, um, zero expectations journaling every morning, just letting it kind of flow out. Um, sometimes I'll reflect back on things that I picked up from the day before, things like that. Um, so that's a great way, kind of how I start with capturing those initial good ideas that are pretty fleeting. But um, outside of that, also just keeping open lines of communication at all times, definitely trying to touch base, keep everybody involved. Um, kind of like, like you said, here at Lucky Orange, we definitely have a very close, tight-knit um, group of people who across teams were always working together. So whether I'm involving four different people from four different teams, um, but trying to just keep those lines of communication open at all time is what I found really helps. And it also allows a lot more people to kind of give their own input that typically wouldn't feel like they have um, the space or the floor to provide ideas on things that they don't work on on the day-to-day -day basis. So those are two like the biggest ways that I'm able to kind of attempt to, to capture all the great ideas. There's always going to be ones that um, float away, but I think the good ones always try to get captured at least. And I do want to talk about the communication process and really get granular there, but I'm curious on the journaling side of things, is there anything that that's taught you about the way you think or about the way you know the world works um, and, and how to prioritize those inputs that you're getting? Because design, even as simple, you know, graphic design, product design, whatever it might be, I think for a lot of us who aren't designers, it feels slightly out of reach because you're, you're connecting the dots between that tree that you saw in the park and something that can happen in the app. Is there something with journaling that you've learned about yourself or, or the way you think? Yeah. Uh, the biggest thing I think that I, the takeaway from that is really the eliminating the, the distractions and that no expectations part of being open to actually letting your mind kind of run through all the possibilities and not holding any expectations on that ideation process. Um, I, I think it's really easy to get caught up in, 
if you've got an end result that you know you're getting to, but you're trying to be a bit more creative or ideate on something just to see how far you can push the box, if you're starting still with that kind of end goal in mind, there's still restrictions there that you're not even noticing. Um, so really trying to be as free form as possible and let yourself just let stuff flow out. And, and the journal almost works as it's going to capture all the good ideas, but it's also kind of a trash can, if you will. You know, there's most of that stuff that goes in there is going to get thrown away and you have to be okay with that. And that is eliminating those distractions, I think allows me then to take that approach on non-journaling activities or when we're actually having meetings or I'm working collaborative, collaboratively um, with people, I'm able to kind of get into that mode, eliminate the distractions. And that also then helps the person that I'm communicating with or collaborating with, allows them to feel a bit more comfortable and feel like they can kind of drop those expectations, drop the barriers and just openly let the ideas flow. And then work our way backwards, reel it in a bit, land on something, highlight that. Um, but but still just trying to be as unstructured as possible early on. Um, I think that's definitely the biggest takeaway for me. Certainly during those discovery points, um, you know, I find when we're, when we're coming up with a new content campaign or marketing campaign, there's definitely a great way to use silliness or outlandish thinking or whatever as a means to sort of reframe or remove the box entirely that you you thought you were going to think in. And oftentimes I've found, at least on my end, that that can kind of be the grease that leads to the more refined idea um, that may ultimately be more creative um, or, or, or more uh, well thought because it has that context of, well, what if this was, you know, not the case at all? What if we completely reframed this um, and removing, sure. like you said, those expectations of, there is a process already laid out. We're kind of just doing this meeting and this brainstorm as a formality. Um, yeah. You know, you, you allow yourself to be more creative if you can kind of put less pressure on it. Yeah. Getting out of the, the everyday motions and allowing things to kind of flex and adjust and think about things ways that, you know, you may not think about on your own. And I think that's the other side of the journal that I come back to all the time is, I'll, I like to like go back even like a month or so to an older journal and things like that. And you start reading and you're like, what was I even thinking about? But there's always those little nuggets in there that you find. And you're like, man, that, that was a good one. I didn't know, why have I forgotten about that? So like, there's going to be those kind of wild outlandish things that, you know, you may not want to share publicly, but I also think by sharing and bringing those things into, um, a more professional space or just like bringing those into a meeting, you then kind of drop all of the, the formalities. And, and like I said, other people then start to kind of feel open to thinking that way too. Um, and then that in itself becomes your new process of allowing time at the beginning of everything to kind of have that. What if, um, you know, throw everything at the wall and we'll kind of reel it back in later. So let's talk a little bit about then the process. Um, you know, we've talked about kind of the beginning of ideation and discovery. Um, a lot of the situations within Lucky Orange are that we've received feedback about something or that we have an idea for an enhancement of an existing tool. The other bucket being a completely new tool that we see the industry evolving into or, or something like that. Can you take me through your role in the design process from maybe one of those three buckets or, or how it works across the board from that initial idea into engineering and maybe some of the feedback loops and how all that's worked along the way for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, first off, I, I think the being the designer or in product design, it brings in some expectations from the outside of what you will be working on or kind of what you anticipate, what you wouldn't be involved in normally. Um, and, as I've kind of grown as a product designer, you start to realize how many things you're involved in that you wouldn't consider uh, traditional design projects or tasks of, of a designer. Um, but I think that's kind of like the, the beautiful part of it or the exciting part of my job is that I'm designing more than just an interface. It, there, there's systems involved, there's um, relationships, there's um, kind of those processes, even designing a process that is going to work. Um, but from the, the start of it, outside of kind of having those initial discussions, leaving time for ideation, I 
definitely like to always build in research time. I think that's, I need time to kind of collect my thoughts. And I think that's what allows me to come back um, to the group with kind of a, a rounded idea or kind of a, a pitch for something is really giving my time to dig in, research the topic at hand um, and become a, a topic expert or a, you know, an expert in that for the time being as, as much as I can. Um, and then being able to bring that back to the group and allow um, the group to kind of validate my research for me. Um, you know, that, that's the time that they're able to kind of throw questions out or say, I'm not sure I'm 100% aligning with that or where'd you find that? Um, calling me on my stuff in order to make sure that my research is holding up to that. Um, I, that's a big part of the, the starting process for me is becoming an expert in whatever it is, if, I'm, if it's something that I'm not too aware of already. And if it is something that I'm, I'm aware of and maybe don't need to dedicate as much research time to it, um, still being able to use those ideas or kind of think outside of the box when it comes to research and maybe things that you wouldn't think are related to the topic at hand, giving time to kind of look into ways other places are doing it or something similar um, out in the real world. Definitely big on kind of getting research done firsthand basis versus just using a browser and trying to read documents or, or journals, academic journals and stuff. Um, real world experiences key, I think, especially in the product design world um, and experience design. If you're going to be designing experiences for, for people, you need to understand how and where they're experiencing these things at. So getting out there in those places is also really, really helpful. Um, and, and from that, then I, I, that's when I'll probably start to transition more into the, um, what you would expect as a, a design role of like bringing that thing, those things in um, after I've validated the research, starting to think about prototyping, starting to think about, you know, what are the different user flows? Where is this going to, what are the touch points? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, and sometimes that's really extensive. It could be working on one thing for multiple months, but it also could, that process could take me two days. It could take me four hours. Um, so definitely the scope on that can vary depending on what you're doing. Um, but again, always just trying to start with the research process there. And obviously, the, the majority of designers who start in a role at an existing company are inheriting a lot of legacy UX and UI product decisions that happened before them. So it seems that there's quite a balance of being respectful of the decisions that were made beforehand while still trying to innovate and enhance what, what's existing there. What's that been like? You know, you've been with Lucky Orange for a decent while now. What's that been like exploring? Uh, the process of understanding the decisions that were made before you, even though the, the majority of the people that may have made some of those decisions specifically related to the user experience um, are, are no longer on the team. Um, what's that been like to explore that and, you know, better understand why things are the way they are as you go into changing them? Yeah, that, that honestly was one of the biggest challenges for me um, when I first uh, came into all of this is, trying to get yourself in kind of the, the space or the, uh, the mindset that they were in previously. Um, and, and, and that kind of harkens back to the research side of this is I spent a lot of time in my research, um, I guess you could say, was really just trying to understand those decisions and, and understand why things were done a specific way, um, understanding where maybe what was their best quality work and what was maybe something that was rushed and trying to understand those pain points of noticing if something doesn't align, was it something, was it because there weren't processes in place in order to get us to the correct spot or uh, kind of fully work that out? Or was it more so um, this was intentional and then trying to understand why it was intentional? That was huge. And, and the other part of that is the reason you kind of want to get your place get yourself into a place where you do understand that is because if you're going to come in and start to make suggestions or make changes and kind of maybe not throw all of that away, but optimize it and things are going to get, are going to fall off after that, you need to be able to justify that in some way, whether that's justifying mm -hmm. it to yourself, justifying it to um, the others involved, um, to your bosses, you need to be able to back that up. And when they do come with the why of why are we changing this or why are we getting rid of this? definitely being able to be informed enough to give an answer that's informative and kind of get that buy-in. I, th I mean, that's huge. 
Uh, yeah. The other side of that too, though, I think is being able to recognize that obviously each designer or everyone in these roles is going to have different strengths and being able to kind of recognize those strengths. And they may not be exactly the way that you would do them or the way that you would think about things, but if they're working and they're successful, there may not be a need to kind of reinvent the wheel just because you've started somewhere that they've moved on and they've, they've gone somewhere else and you're coming and taking over and you kind of feel like, okay, I've got so much power, but knowing when and where to use that um, and recognizing that although I may feel like I have a better way of doing it right now, it's successful and what's going to involve kind of making those changes isn't valuable enough or may not be needed right now. Um, so that's another huge part of it. And it can quickly bite you in the butt. You know, there's a, the age old story of a new CMO coming into a company and saying, we need to rebrand, we need a new website, we need a new tagline, we need all of this and sort of feigning progress by just doing things and, and, and taking action. Um, yeah. And reality, especially with design, you know, you're trying to optimize it so that the users can have a better experience. Now, of course, you want to show that you're working hard and that you're bringing right. value, you're adding value to the company. But I think you're right that you can't just make wholesale changes or, or even small changes to say, look, this, this part of the app is different now. It looks different. It might even look objectively or subjectively better. Um, but is it better for the user? Um, and that, that feels yeah. like such a fine balance and really a challenge for designers, uh, maybe even specifically early in the career to say, I'm coming in and I'm representing the needs of the user, but I have to translate it into a way that's buildable by our team, that's supportable long-term, that makes sense to, to everybody here, and then ultimately drives more engagement with the customers. Well, yeah, and there can, there can be a lot of like friction in that process too of trying to find those spots of where you can push things and, and where you maybe in that might not be valuable, valuable enough to, to do that. But the other side of that is you may be, the changes you make or the things that you're noticing may not be directly, I guess, design related. Um, like back to, there's a lot of processes that come with that. Um, you may be affecting a lot more people involved than you typically would, um, if, even if it's just not a, something you're changing on the UI or on, on the product side. Um, if you're trying trying to change structures within an organization or the way of doing things in an organization, um, I mean, there's a lot of it's daunting, and it's daunting for a lot of people, especially coming into a place where you may not um, fully even understand the the kind of hierarchy of roles yet. Um, trying to understand, you know, who you're going to be affecting, how that's going to affect them and how they're going to respond to that is huge. Um, and, and that's kind of relying on relationships within um, trying to build those at just as much as you're trying to evolve the product and change the product itself. You're also trying to kind of change the way other people are doing things. So there can be a lot of friction in that process. And so trying to come into it as formed as possible is definitely going to be the best route. Um, at least from my experience. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've had a couple of different career or a couple of different jobs where I've been the first or one of the first sort of content marketing hires. And we just, part of the goal is to define the role of content for the business. How, how does it make a difference? How does it help us advance towards our business objectives? But also how do we just do it? Um, in yeah. regards to design, I feel like that's been a big undertaking is, um, you know, as somebody who's representing design and all these different conversations with marketing and technical and, and all that, that you're not only saying, here's my opinion on this specific topic, but also here's the surrounding process. Here's the research I did and, um, you know, digging into the entirety of it so that it's repeatable and it's not just, okay, well, how did we approach this the last time? I don't remember. Okay, let's just start over. So you right. know, building, building that system out. I, I am curious, you know, marketing and design are similar in the way that they're very approachable to have an opinion about. So somebody can say, I don't like your logo or I don't, you know, I think that the tagline should be this. And they don't really have to have, you don't have to have a marketing background or a design background to have an opinion on those things. And so I'm curious from your standpoint, you know, how you've been able to manage and, and successfully 
navigate um, opinions across teams, again, respectfully, um, but also get the most out of what those people are saying and kind of dig into the, the reality, the second layer maybe of what they're saying to help you advance towards the design goals? Yeah, um, I'd say definitely I am the type of person I come into those situations open and willing to be wrong. I think that's huge um, for every role, but I think specifically in design or somewhere where you're getting direct feedback on the, out, the, the outcome of your work, um, all of the hard um, blood, sweat, and tears that you put into something is going to go up in front of someone and they're going to provide um, commentary. They're going to provide feedback. It may not be good. It may be good. But at the start, I think it's really important to be open to opposing ideas and let that be kind of an avenue for conversation of, you know, why you may be wrong and trying to understand kind of, like you said, is trying to understand where they're coming from and not so much of why they're doing this to you. It's not something that's directed at you, but understanding that they're coming from a place of they care for the product just as much as you do. Um, so there's going to be situations where their ideas are just as valid as yours and they may clash, but then trying to understand what am I not considering here that why didn't I consider that question? What am I not considering in from their space of why that would benefit them or why they feel this way? But I also do think it's important to kind of come in with your line in the sand. What, what are the things that, you, what are your deal breakers? Um, and just back to the, the research side or being informed, coming to those things still flexible, but being able to back that up and, and let them know if they are crossing that line of, saying why we wouldn't go that direction or being able to kind of push back a little bit on those things. But from the start, I think it's really important to start as open as possible, as many conversations as possible, because we are going to have so many people involved who aren't directly um, dealing with your day to day. So they may not be aware of the time or work that went into this. And so realizing that this is all for the better of the product, it's not something that's directly reflected upon the, your work or the way you did things. Um, but just coming in prepared, anticipate the questions before they come. That's super huge. If you can anticipate someone's going to say something and have a response for that right away, there's a really good chance that they're going to kind of realize, oh, maybe that my question wasn't as prepared as they were to answer it. Um, that's another great way to kind of just keep everybody on their toes and they'll start to consider those questions a bit more too. And the feedback you'll get is will become much more constructive and direct um, where you won't get a full meeting full of, well, what ifs and pie in the sky ideas. It does become a bit more directed and more about um, looking at what's at hand and not getting outside of that. It's almost like you're trying to train people to think like a designer, you know, you're trying yeah. to help them understand the way you're approaching things. And of course, continue bringing their context of customer support or of engineering or of leadership of, you know, being on the financial side of things or whatever their context is with their specific role. But when there's a discussion or a portion of a discussion that's about design, kind of switch on that, that switch in their head and give them those reps of thinking like a designer uh, to come through. And I, I do love, you know, what you're talking about with drawing a line in the sand. And obviously this plays out very differently at different types of organizations, different types of organizations have different ways of going about stuff, but it, it does feel like clarity um, in a role is always something you should be seeking. And it, and it goes both ways. So as somebody that's leading a company, helping people understand what their role is, where it starts, where it, where it you know, begins and ends, but then also as a, an individual contributor or no matter what sort of level you're at, if you can seek clarity with the people that you're engaging with on a regular basis, who are making decisions that enable you to make your decisions, you say, Hey, look, this is the part of the, this is the part of the project where I'm making a decision and it's going to be based on these interactions we have there. But then after that's over it, there's a handoff or there's another decision that needs, needs to be made by somebody else. That clarity, it just, it's always so helpful. Um, and it yeah. can go, things can go really South and, and get, turn into a traffic jam if you don't have that. Well, I think it's really noticeable, right? As far as if, if someone else, if you're going into someone else's meeting that they've set up and, and they're looking for feedback and you can kind of immediately notice that they aren't prepared, 
or you know maybe they didn't have enough time to prepare or whatever the reasons are it's super noticeable right away that maybe this wasn't thought through all the way and so if you're the one putting other people in that situation of i'm looking for feedback but i don't have the answer yet or have um kind of back to the line of the sand of where are my deal breakers if i'm not able to kind of convey those right away they're gonna walk all over that because they don't know where the line is of course they're gonna push that line and you're gonna come out of that more frustrated and confused you're gonna have more questions as to why reflected on yourself versus walking out of there with questions regarding how we can continue advancing the product or if it's about the meeting structure itself um but i mean a lot of people go into a design review or a review that involves design and their immediate thought is we're going to be looking at images of stuff or we're going to be commenting on the colors of something or the layout of something. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times at the end of the day, we're a business, right? And so the real things we're talking about are, are what impacts do these things have on the business and to the customers. And so if you're able to come in informed with answers that more pertain to that or questions for people um, that are, in their level area of expertise, um, they're going to kind of understand that you've done the work or put in the work to understand where they might be coming from. And there's going to be less time debating um, these things back and forth and more time actually getting the answers you need and then moving on short and quick. You're not going to have those hour long meetings of back and forth and, and kind of, well, why did you do this? And then trying to justify things. I, I think a lot of people think because it's a design review, they may not have to have the answers for um, for other roles. But I mean, if you can consider the, the business impacts or the impacts it's going to have on messaging um, or the time that it's going to take for your engineers to, to kind of build these things out, not only are they going to be happier, but you're going to not going to come out of this down on yourself. You're going to be able to kind of walk away and continue that ideation process and, and keep moving forward. I mean, no one wants to have a meeting where you walk out upset or angrier than you went walked in right so yeah uh, more the, questions as prepared you as you can be yeah yeah, yeah. right yeah and walking it, in with a list of questions and then you walk out with a you know 20 more and you know you need another meeting to to answer them again it's just a back and forth process it becomes a cycle yeah and i think on the flip side the the efficient meetings do make everybody feel great about where things are heading they make people feel confident and once your design review is complete and things are being handed off, it goes to the engineering team or whoever it might be distributed to. They're confident then that they're not designing something that still has unanswered questions. Of course, there's questions that come up, but they get to run with things and kind of hit the ground moving much faster than if it was like, okay, I was in that meeting and I saw things swirling. Is this actually what we're building or, or are we heading in a kind of a unified front in the right direction? Yeah, that or even during then the process, specifically for engineers when working um, with the engineering team, it during their build process, I mean, you don't want them coming back to you with questions that should be, they should know already. And then you kind of, you have this kind of friction of yourself like, well, kind of, why don't you know that? But it comes back to why didn't you provide that at the beginning? They wouldn't yeah. be asking these questions. And so being able to be prepared enough for those things to even be addressed early on, you're going to just make the process not even easier for yourself, but also for everyone involved. And I promise you that they will look at you 10 times in a, in a brighter light if you're able to provide those things up front um, versus them having to come back with a list of things to, to meet again over multiple times. Switching gears just slightly, what do you think is something that people get wrong about design? Um, and that could, of course, be somebody on a different you know, role, different team, but what's kind of one UX myth, UX myth that people are getting wrong? Yeah, I, I love this one. I feel like I, this is brought up a lot in either other podcasts that I listen to or social posts. I feel like I hear it everywhere from designers of my top 10 design myths or UX <laughs> myths or product myths, you know, whatever that I, mm -hmm. that I want to prove wrong. I think the one that probably sticks out the most to me, I'm trying to think this through originally, there were so many to weigh through, but it always came back to that design has to be original. I think because designers get lumped in with quote unquote artist, I guess you could say, when there's a lot of times I feel like an imposter in that world where I, you know, I'm probably closer um, aligned with a lot of the engineers or developers out there anyways. Um, but the fact that 
design has to be original and that these established user interface conventions, that they are your friend at the end of the day. Things that other people have poured their time, you know, heart and soul into relying on those and not trying to reinvent the wheel. Every single, you know, touch point you have, everything you touch, you feel that, oh, because it's mine now, I've got to put my mark on it. Or I've got to kind of, kind of make my place or make a statement with this. It's a button, you know, at the end mm -hmm. of the day, like, you know, it's mm -hmm. like you, how many, how many true ways can you design a button or how many ways can you really design a form? Um, there are conventions out there that are established and because the people using this aren't familiar with those conventions, they feel just normal. And so when you break out of them, it's so much more noticeable. Um, and, and you see that a lot with kind of these um, pages dedicated to like design as far as like Dribble or Behance, um, even Instagram sometimes of these beautiful interfaces. And it's like, if you were to show that to an engineer, they would just cringe and cry of like, okay, well, I'll see you in a year to try and get this built. Mm -hmm. um, and also at the end of the day, those experiences never end up being great either um, because nothing was considered. It, it's, it's almost just someone hopped into Photoshop rather than started to take the time of thinking through the system itself and relying on the systems that are already in place. I think once you recognize that, you're then able to kind of shift focus on the areas where maybe those conventions aren't as strong. And that's where you can really start to be creative and you, and you save yourself a lot of time and afford yourself a lot of time to, to focus on those things when you don't try to reinvent the wheel every single time. Um, I, I, I think that's one that I, I try to tell even to, to younger designers or people looking just for advice of getting into this field is don't feel like your name has to be on everything or don't feel like when I look at it, I can know that it's yours. It's not a statement piece. At the end of the day, we're trying to make something that's usable and the most easy and frictionless process or experience as possible. Um, and if you're able to do something new and creative in that, great. But it's not not everything has to be that way. Yeah, it feels like an easy trap to fall into. And I've experienced that on the on the content side and specifically when you're you're writing things or you're coming up with taglines and stuff it's you always want to have a world beater idea and it it makes me think of recently there is the thing with Snoop Dogg and Solo Stove where Snoop Dogg came out and yes. said I'm I'm not smoking pot anymore or whatever he specifically said and it ended up being a Solo Stove ad and marketers were just using it as an immediate all-time great case study on LinkedIn and then within a couple of weeks it says okay it didn't actually do that well for them um, from a from a marketing standpoint. It didn't actually perform at a high level. Cute idea, great idea, great personality to pull right. in. And I would sit in a, a meeting and people would say, that's an unbelievable um, idea. Let's pay whatever Snoop wants to, to get this thing on the ground. But right. that internal dialogue may not actually resonate, but it's it's such an easy, attractive, shiny thing to, to chase those cute ideas basically right yeah so you're almost trying to build something around um this flashy name or kind of idea and then you try to just fit it into a box and make it work and you're not even then considering you know whether it's the impact that the, those could have similar to the solo stuff stuff as far as the perceived impact or the kind of the pushback that was there after everything was revealed um people almost felt like betrayed from that it's you know mm -hmm. at the end of the day it's like none of us have a personal relationship with snoop but we have this image in our head of who he was and what he does and you're trying to break that and while yet yeah, it got your attention you leave that experience more frustrated in the end once the outcome is revealed right and so trying to kind of understand back to the conventions that were there of looking at what's been done in the past and what impacts those had before, you know, trying to come up with the next new hot idea. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, earlier in the conversation, we're talking about being creative, being silly, but there is that balance then between that um, and trusting those conventions and understanding what has worked previously. You don't have to blow everything up. It's a different story. If you're a brand new brand and you're a brand new company, there are still conventions. Sure. They may not be, uh, internally proven yet, but there are still things that have happened before you. Um, you know, you've given some some great thoughts already on 
early stage career advice for, for designers. Is there anything specifically that you'd want to call out that has helped you as you navigated, you know, you're still relatively early, um, as you navigated sure. kind of those first steps into meetings and say, okay, I'm a designer, what do I do now? Um, is there anything else that you'd like to call out for anybody listening that might be trying to shape their, their early career in design? Yeah, one of, one of the biggest things I come back to is, get. I, I think I kind of mentioned it earlier of like these kind of creative websites like Dribbler or Behance. I always, always try to avoid any of those things. So in and in younger designers or even designers that are still in school, um, I try to emphasize as much as possible to get off those sites and get into the real world. We were talking earlier about kind of real world um, experiences and trying to learn from things that may not feel that they're a part of the tech world. If you're in the tech world or you're a product designer for a SaaS company, looking at things that aren't SaaS and looking at things that aren't web applications, going in and looking at um, you know the patterns or the systems in place at a grocery store. You know you you've typically got your um, produce on the front right side of a grocery store, and then right before you get to a self checkout or the checkout counter, you're going to have all your frozen items and, and your refrigerated stuff right towards the end. Those are systems that have been put in place forever, and you can start to pick up on those things in the real world and then apply them to um, your your use cases, right? And, and the projects you're working on. Um, and when you're able to do that, I think you you kind of uncover some things or these aha moments for other people when they see it from that lens of, well, I didn't even consider that, or that's a really great way of looking at that. And, and you almost feel like, taking credit for these great ideas when reality mm -hmm. is the, they've been in place forever. Um, so definitely getting out into the real world and, and that side of it too, is once you get into the real world, making those connections with the people that are working in the same job you are or where you're wanting to go to um, make your connections on LinkedIn, reach out. I think most um, people in my, in my shoes would be more than willing to hop on a call or grab coffee um, and, and just have a conversation about what they should be doing, what it's like to work in this role, um, what it's like working at a tech company, definitely just meeting and talking to people versus trying to see what their portfolio website looks like. Right. And everyone's going to put always their, their front, their best foot forward. Um, it's when you start to really uncover what they're not showing you. Um, that's the, the real goal that you want to take away, whether that's things you should be doing or shouldn't be doing. Um, but really just kind of getting in the real world, get away from the trends. Um, it's really now in our social world, it's really easy to follow trends and feel like you're making headway. Um, and you may be, if, if your goal is to get a hundred thousand views or clicks on something, then by all means, yeah, follow the trends. But if your goal is to, you know, evolve your career, advance yourself in your career or advance the product you're working on, whatever that may be, get out there away from the trends and try to look at the things that feel unnoticed. Um, and, and what are the things that just go by every day that we see or interact with every day, but aren't perceived as trendy or new, um, or the next fad, because those things go away so quickly. And it, it, I think we all know that. Um, but it's as an early designer, it's so easy to get immersed in this web world of flashy websites and you know, thinking of, of system thinking, not even considering those things and just trying to be as original as possible, trying to be as flashy as possible. You think I need to be seen waving your arms. In reality, it's it's really going to come down to your work and your quality of work and your web skill, your knowledge. It's, it's not about the pretty UI or pretty design uh, artifacts that you've made. Um, so okay. really just like getting away from trends and, and staying off of those it's okay to look at them. Sure. Every once in a while, it's cool to see what's happening in the past year or what's happening for this year, what people are going to be doing, but not relying on those. And I would really just rely more on those real world connections, real world ideas and kind of real world experiences. Yeah. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned just looking around. I, I think some of the best things that I've taken away and applied to Lucky Orange in the past couple of years, few years have been straight from things like D to C products that I really like and and I see, okay, I'm going to buy something from them or subscribe to their email list or whatever it might be and do some takeaways of what's their email cadence look like. Because 
in the end, of course, our audience is different um, in, in some ways than somebody buying a D two C product, but in other sure. ways, they're still they're still humans and they're still behaving in yeah. a certain way. They still have certain wants, needs, anxieties, motivations, whatever it might be. And there's a lot of lessons that we can apply from different industries that um, can be used inside um, our our tools and our emails and our marketing and whatever it might be. Um, I would be remiss if I let us conclude our conversation without asking about everybody's favorite topic, which is AI. I'm curious, maybe specifically related to tools or process, how you've seen AI change the design world um, within the past, you know, 24 months, whatever it's been since since the kind of revolution has happened. Obviously, we've had AI uh, for a long time, but um, how has it been impacting design work recently? Yeah, I think there was that initial scare. Um, I call it a scare. I guess yeah. it was probably 2019, 2020 of, am I going to lose my job type of thing? Or, you know, what, how does this fit into my role versus how do I work with this within my role? Um, still yet to see any tool out there that can, that would be replacing me. So I, I definitely feel secure. And I think most people should feel that way. Um, but I, my, the biggest thing that I'm starting to notice now more and more um, that kind of felt like it was either unknown or ignored um, outside of the design world that AI is starting to have a big impact on is design systems. I think the, the management of, and, and going back to what we just talked about, of, of these kind of conventions or patterns in the design world, I think AI is starting to allow designers to have so much more time to actually be the creative beings that they want to be by doing and managing the processes that maybe feel monotonous or kind of tired, you know, exhausting, maybe even of whether that's managing your components or, or labeling, adding labels to everything and, or even, um, alt tags. I think that's another big one of, I, I for the longest time am guilty of uploading things without alt tags. And it's like, if, why can't, just the browser add that for me if it knows what's going on, right? Well, I don't know that I'm the best right. person to do that. But I think it's those moments of assistance or trying to, to at least free yourself up um, or free time up to be those creative people versus dedicating all of your time on trying to implement new systems or build systems that work for your product or um, build out these new systems. There's so many things out there in place that AI has essentially learned from now that it's gotten really good at managing those tasks or managing large scale systems that one person just couldn't do effectively. Right. Um, and so I'm starting to see a lot more conversations outside of design and even with, you know, leadership teams at other companies and, um, VPs and CEOs considering, well, what would the impact of a design system be? And, I really think that the reason those things are starting to become more of a conversation is because designers have more time now to focus on actually having an impact on a product and returning um, value outside of just monotonous work and only kind of touching base once a week at once a month, whatever that is. I think the return is becoming more noticeable where it, we're shifting to, well, we can accomplish this now. What's it, what, what can I do for you for, <clears throat> to get you there, to that place? Um, and AI has kind of uh, afforded us all the time to have those conversations, be able to consider those things fully without it being um, something that maybe we aren't fully knowledgeable in, but we're still making the recommendation. AI has kind of filled that gap there. Um, so nothing as far as it's replacing my job, it's going to do all of this stuff for me, but it's just... I think every day there's something new where I know that that would actually be a great assistant or, you know, that'd be able to assist me in some way, whether it's mundane task or like I said, even back to systems of adding labels to things. Now, if I've got, you know, a hundred components that are all one-off variables of each other, adding labels to each one of those is going to take me two hours, or I can provide that to some type of AI tool and it's done in five minutes, that's just afforded me so much more time to consider what impact this is going to have on the business. How am I going to pitch this to my bosses? Um, what do I need to involve in that that maybe aren't design related, whether that is um, your KPIs or how it's having an impact, 
impact on revenue. Um, you can start thinking about th those things. Whereas I feel like designers maybe thought that they couldn't get there, whether that was just because they didn't have the resources or time to, I'm not sure, but we're starting to see designers have more of a seat at the table. And I definitely contribute a lot of that to AI taking up the, the tasks that we were stuck doing almost. Yeah. I know you're pretty plugged in on that side. So we may have to run this back and do a, an all AI tool uh, episode, yeah. but I really appreciate you carving out time today, sharing some wisdom with everybody. Um, really helpful and, and great perspective for people as they navigate design uh, careers, but also just the design conversations whether they're a designer or not, uh, being able to successfully communicate with the wild child of the company that's the UX designer. So uh, appreciate Definitely. you jumping on um, and I'll, I'll chat with you soon. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Really appreciate All it. Right.